Okay, so um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jim Wright, uh, of the people who we mentioned about doing field work last year. Jim had the distinction of going on a couple of different cruises. Uh, we heard about Sam's cruise uh, on the Chilean margin. On the other side of that same continent, Antipodes of the continent is the Argentine margin. And uh, Jim, along with uh, colleagues, uh, undertook writing a proposal for the International Ocean Discovery Program for drilling. And one of those things that those proposals often need is new seismics. They were using data collected by German scientists, um, very excellent data, but it wasn't in exactly the correct spot. So, they put together a cruise with Chris Charles and others that you hear about and went out to collect uh, seismic data and, and uh, piston cores to ground through some IODP work. Uh, Jim is a full professor in our department, uh, came to us and I found a picture. I was going to scan it in, but I thought I wouldn't from you and I, Jim, and uh, your daughter when she was about three years old in, in uh, my office at Rutgers. So I think you, you you know, we go way back. Jim received his PhD uh, from Lamont. He had received previously his uh, master's degree working with the late Bob Pennell, the University of South Carolina on uh, micropaleontology of Plutonic Worm Nipper in the Miocene Indian Ocean. So a bunch of us are working on the Miocene again, and certainly Jim made his bone, early bones on that topic. Uh, obviously, he's director of the Stable Isotope Lab in our department. And so without further ado, Jim, welcome and take over, please. All right. Are you going to record now, Ken? You're muted, but that's all right. Hi, Jim, it is recording. All right, let me move this over to this. So you should see um, my screen right now. Last fall, I actually in 2019, I think I slept uh, in a different bed than my 150 nights. And I owe a great thanks to my wife, Laura, and my son, Brian, who, who kept up the house and everything for me. And one of those, or actually about 55 to 60 of those nights was this uh, research cruise that Neil Slowin and I were chief scientists on to the Southern Argentine margin. If you're into numbers, um, the cruise left on 9-11 and returned on Halloween. Um, my IODP proposal is also IODP 9-11. So, um, maybe there are good things in the numbers here. So, I thought I would take for um, people who aren't scientists who are attending and a couple of graduate students, how did we get to now? Uh, how did you see the results of, um, of um, the science, but how did we get to now? Well, in the spring of 2015, I got a call from Neil Slowey who said, hey, Jim, and I know that it could be a 45 minute to an hour and a half phone call. And it turns out that um, he alerted me to this IODP workshop on the Southern Argentine margin that was to be held in September of 2015. I was going on sabbatical and then going to see in October. So. I said, sure, I applied, got invited to be a keynote speaker. Um, Roger Flood and Thomas, uh, Tomas Gorgas were the organizers. And, you know, look, I like steak, I like red wine. Why not go to Argentina for a wonderful meeting? Here's Roger Flood from SUNY Stony Brook on the left in one of the meeting rooms that we attended. And, I did not have a good picture of Tomas in the, uh, at the meeting. And this is um, a picture on the Joides resolution. He and I sailed together in 2012. 
but the meeting was at the Palicio San Martin, which is a beautiful um, um, venue to have uh, meetings. And here is my co-PI, uh, Neil Slowey, standing next to the bust of San Mar General San Martin, um, just outside of the palace. I'll be remiss if I uh, don't mention um, all of the work that is going on. Roberto Violante is probably the most knowledgeable on the Argentine margin geology. Javier Hernandez Molina, his uh, work will be um, featured in here, although I'll be showing uh, Jens Kutzner and Gabby Anzelman-Nabin's uh, seismic lines more than I'll be showing Javier's. But, his work was instrumental as well. And then Natalia uh, has also been very helpful in guiding us and helping us in our crews together. So Neil and I came out of that IODP meeting and started working on an NSF and GNG proposal. We realized we needed more seismics uh, to really write a good IOD pr proposal. We submitted first in August 2016, and then we resubmitted in 2017, learned May 2018 that it was funded, but then we must find a global class ship to um, go. And the Thompson, um, which is a UW ship, University of Washington ship, um, was going to be in our area um, last year, and that's where we sailed. So, we flew to Montevideo, Uruguay. It's about an hour closer to the ocean than Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is this dot and Montevideo is right there. This is actually breakfast of the first morning. Uh, Papa Fritas is, uh, is um, quite popular in Montevideo. Our first night there, we were having a time finding uh, a good place to eat because everything looked real expensive because I was using my Chilean peso to US dollar conversion as opposed to the Uruguayan um, peso to dollar conversion. We finally went to the small restaurant, no one was in it, um, and it turned the reservation only tango night. And so we were treated to live tango during our dinner that night. Uh, this is another dinner, and their meats and red wines are, are very popular. And here's our last meal before we had to move ashore. And there's actually another plate of meat just this big about to be served to them at the other end of the table. Oops, went the wrong way. We stayed in an Airbnb. It was called an artist um, house, and it was really cool both uh, architecturally and also uh, physically because the heat didn't work and it was September and the outside air was about 50 degrees. Um, but it was a wonderful place. And once again, here's Papa Fritas and here's the caretaker of that house. When we got back in November, it's much nicer, 70 degrees, lots of artists out on the um, walks and lots of shops to go to. The crew, I want to thank them. They made pretty much all of the science possible that we could get. Here's Captain Eric Harrelson, first mate Mark, um, and Dave with AB Mark, and Emmett helping put on a bird, which I'll explain a little bit later on. In the science party, uh, we were supported by, they're called SSSGs. We know them as marine techs. We had Jenny Nomura, Liz Ricci, and a uh, intern, Emily Young, who helped us. The seismic crew was led by Colby Pedri and, and Brendan Mendenhall and helped by Consuelo and Roy. Oh, and Ray Hatton, you'll see a picture of him, of him a little bit later. He didn't fit and the picture for the ship was a picture of his cat, so. I won't show that. The Oregon State uh, Coring Crew uh, was led by Drew Cole and Mike Lewis with help from Chris Franchier and Ben Freeberg. And we, because it's a seismic uh, cruise, we had to have marine mammal 
watchers, and here they are, Bandy, Molly, and Max. We joke, did you have to have your name, first name start with an M to be part of this marine mammals? The science crew, here's the Texas A&M group with, led by Neil Slowey, the co-chief. Jose from Ecuador helped us in translation greatly. Ruby, who has joined us on the call, and Ricky has joined us on the call. Tanner was uh, honorary at Texas A&M, even though he's at East Carolina. Um, he's a friend of Ruby's and was uh, brought on that way. Our Coastal Carolina group is uh, Assistant Professor Teddy Thim, and uh, he brought along Trey Gillespie, who is a geology and science communication major. And then our group with me, Alex Adams, who is now working for the USGS up in um, Ithaca, Tim Seamus, a new graduate student, Aaron, and Mark. We had to have um, Argentine observers and Grego and Jose joined us. Grego was a geology undergraduate major and now is an officer in the Argentine Navy. Jose Azola is very knowledgeable, very helpful. His PhD is in our study area. And both of them, while I've been on cruises where um, the observers have slept, eaten, watched movies, slept, eaten, gone to the weight room, slept, eaten, watched movies, and that's all they do for about a month or two. Uh, both uh, Grego and Jose became part of the science team and really did a lot of work that helped us out. Among the um, Marine Tech's um, official um, duties were to inform everybody when marine mammals were um, um, spotted. But here's the nerve center for the ship uh, right in here. We have, um, we have cameras to see what's going on on deck. We have swap imagery. We have 3.5 kilohertz, which allows us to see what the sub bottom down to 20 to 30 meters. The screen, you know, we just see you. Um, I'm just pointing. Did that come back? Not yet, Jim. <clears throat> just see me. Yeah, go back up and share a screen again. Uh, let me escape. Come over here. I'm trying not to touch my magic mouse. Yeah, for some reason, it looks like it dropped out. Yes, now? We're back. Okay, thank you. We're getting your whole screen. Yeah, I'm trying to start my power. There we go. Okay. Good job. <laughs> So I must have, oh, I know what I did. I drug across my sharing screen up there most likely. All right, so here you can have the seismic group over here in the corner where you can monitor if the guns are firing, if the streamer is at the proper level, if you're collecting data. And over here, the typical, um, what the bottom look like with, and the cameras on the deck. And here is um, Emily about to deploy at XBT, and I don't have time to explain that right now. So what did we do uh, with 51 days at sea? It took us about two days to get to our study area from Montevideo, and we started shooting seismics, and we shot over 4,000 kilometers of high-resolution seismic lines. We also took 62 cores with about 380 meters of sediment collected during this time. And I'll go through what a jumbo piston core, what a gravity core, and what a multi-core are in just a minute. Now, some people ask me, what are you doing? What are seismics? What are quarries? And I liken it or explain it as a CT scan and biopsies. But instead of taking images of the body and then biopsying uh, an unknown mass, we are taking images of the seafloor and what's below it 
and sticking cores into it to figure out um, what exactly the image is telling us. We were really concerned um, about weather. Um, our colleague Natalia, when she learned that the cruise was September through October, she goes, oh, we usually go in January, uh, but you might get lucky. And turns out we did for most of the time. They gave us four extra days because they knew it was a bad win weather window. And I think we ended up losing uh, two days due to weather. This was one of those times. This is windy.com. And in it, you can get the forecast of what the winds and knots are, what the waves height is going forward. And we like things in the greens and blues to operate. And this was one time when the storm actually came across the Andes and nailed us. A lot of the times they went just to the south and sometimes they skirted to the north, but we tended to be kind of in a safe spot except for on this day. Oops. And we, um, this was a picture I took from the bridge on that particular day when seas were upwards of 25 feet, I think it was. And here is off the fan tail looking at the wave heights that were approaching 20 feet. And here's a movie from Tanner. This is in the aft hangar. So this is the starboard side looking out. Um, and Um, some of our Rutgers students had potty mouths. I won't say who was uh, in the eclipse there, but um, they were the ones who were getting wet and cold. And the, uh, and the water temperature here is about four degrees C, so um, we were always working in a and when you got wet, you got cold as well. No. That's Neil Ken, if you could um, mute him. By the end of the cruise, we started getting days that look like this, and the upper left of this screen is the WAVOS or the wave radar, and it looks pretty ominous, but this is actually the best of conditions. The radar can't find any waves, and so it um, projects um, um, what looks ominous, but is actually an indicator of almost ideal conditions. Now, let's start getting into seismic data collection. This is still up on Greg's floor, and I think it's been there for two years, maybe longer, but it's a good illustration of what's going on. We have a ship going around five knots, 4.8, you'll see in a minute. Um, we have a sound source, which is compressed air. It is suspended from, here's the little float over in here. There's two guns. It's suspended and it's 25, 26 meters behind the back of the ship. Beyond that, we have a streamer of hydrophones that are our ears. And so the air guns will send out a pulse. It will go down to the bottom of the ocean and return sound waves back to these streamers. I won't go into the geometry, but by having more than one ear, you could look at all many different geometries and put them back together and get um, reduce, increase your signal to noise ratio. Once again, I can't give enough um, credit to Brendan and Colby, Brendan on the left, who was night shift and Colby on the right. If it's broke, Brendan's gonna be the one who fixes it. And Colby is everything software wise, and they made a wonderful team that allowed us to collect quite a bit of seismic data and high resolution seismic data. Here's Consuela, um, and she is holding in the upper right here the liquid field um, streamer. This has the hydrophones in it. We're deploying, there's a about a kilometer streamer right in here that deploys behind the ship. And we put birds on the streamer that are controlled by computers to keep the streamer at a constant depth. And I forget how many birds there are, but um, it's to keep the streamer floating uh, below the sea surface at a constant depth. 
here's Ray Hatton, and Ray had a love-hate relationship. These are our, in the upper center panel, are our uh, compressors that supplied the air to the air guns. And throughout this uh, cruise, um, we kept finding parts of the compressor in the upper right here is shown some of the cooling coils for the um, high pressure um, stage of the these uh, compressors. And you don't have time to go back and take them in when you're at sea. And Brendan and Ray were able to fix and keep us going. Um, and here in the lower right um, are Roy and, uh, and Colby attaching a bird to the streamer. So this is a, uh, I'm just gonna play this. This is a movie and you can look just below the streamer and you can see the air coming out. She's having 10 seconds. Oh, there it is. So that's our sound source. Our seismic processing was done real time on the ship using seismic units. Uh, we, um, some of our lines were up to 50 gigabytes and it'd take about six hours on the ship to do it. Now using Emerald high speed computing at Rutgers, it can be done in less than an hour. The day shift is shown here with Jose and Aaron working with Neil in the upper right panel. Alex had wonderful patience with me. Uh, she is showing Brendan and Consuela the most recent results. I was forever saying, Alex, is it ready? Alex, is it ready? And she had a lot of patience in dealing with me on that. For the longest time, for most of our crews, this is all we saw on the seismic data uh, collection. It's called a brute stack. You can see the seafloor and maybe one or two layers, and that's telling you that, hey, we're collecting data but not much interpretable here. By the end of the cruise, Colby installed a new seismic processing system that is now part of the Scripps um, package, and you can process your seismics in real time. And what it shows here is the, this little panel right in here is the 3.5 kilohertz. It's looking at the sea floor and about 40 meters below. It's high frequency, so it doesn't penetrate as deeply, but we can see some of the layers. But the point here is we're coming out of a canyon with a lot of sad echoes up onto a drift and the seismic is processing in real time. It's only a few minutes behind where the uh, ship is actually located and the resolution is just spectacular. We also had to shut down when marine mammals and these are marine mammals uh, captured on our cruise. Um, we had hourglass dolphins in the upper right and the lower left. And we also had right whales, sperm whales, minkies. I, I forget how many whales and I we'll probably should do a slideshow on whales one day. But we had to shut down for 15 minutes. Um, because we traversed this margin so many times, uh, Neil and I elected not to go back and reshoot every time we saw a marine mammal. And uh, these are 15 minute uh, segments right in here. So evidently they came, we shut down, they disappeared, we turned back on, they came down and then they returned a third time and then finally they disappeared or it became night. Um, the mark of a good seismic cruise is a lot of boredom, lots of game playing, lots of ping pong, Lots of crossword puzzle with Emily down in here. I mean, there were crossword puzzles everywhere because we collected so much seismic uh, data and it was largely went off without a hitch. Now coin, we did uh, gravity cores. It's a 20 foot steel pipe with a five to 6,000 core head. And this is what you use when you really don't know what kind of sediments at the bottom. And in fact, a lot of our sediment was quite stiff Sometimes this did not even recover anything. It probably hit the bottom and fell over. The piston cores are longer. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. And they um, are designed to go into soft sediments. And then the multi-core is designed, it only gets you 
10 to 20 centimeters, but as you will see, it captures what the C4 looks like right at this particular moment. This is the night shift. It's early morning. We were 12 midnight to 12 noon with Jose Azola. And we have just pulled a gravity core here out of the liner. The core head is now sideways and core pipe is right in here. And we pulled out this inner liner. You can see the mud in the end of it. And this is what it looks like as it goes down into the water. The jumbo piston core is now 50 feet long. And you can see it in the middle, the core head of it here, and it stretches 50 feet along the side. It is lifted off of those rails. And as it goes into the water, you see a trigger arm right in here. So there is a weight. It's actually a 10 foot gravity core at the bottom. When the gravity core hits, it releases a trigger right in here and allows this core to fall about 10 feet. Uh, right in there, and it slowly goes into the soft sediments. Um, you can see here that this is a brittle star that we found in the top of the gravity course. The whole core is designed to uh, recover the sea floor. It looks like a lunar lander to me, and it's deployed off the side. There are eight clear tubes right in here, and as you can see, it goes down, lands very, very softly, goes into the sediment of 10 centimeters or so. And you can see it, the water is clear and we have eight uh, representations of what the seafloor looks like Charlie, there. are you okay, honey? Um, so, and here we are on one of the multi-cores. We have, I think it's a bryozoan and Trey Gillespie here is, uh, we have now cut off the top and you can see it, um, stick it out. The bottom is undisturbed when we collect the multi-cores. Lots of core cutting, lots of core labeling, lots of core taping, um, lots of activity and people love to take cores because you're not bored, always something to do. So why should we study the Argentine margin? Well, just real simply, it's where climate and deep water circulation um, can be seen, how those interact together. And if we add the geologic time scale, that is hundreds of thousands to millions of years, we can begin to look at tectonics. The reason that climate and circulation is important is because 50% of the energy that goes into mixing deep water circulation is input into the deep ocean. And it, as part of the Antarctic circumpolar current in the Southern Ocean. Climate is, well, we're near Antarctica and Antarctica controls the Southern Westerlies. If Antarctic ice sheet is small, then the Westerlies move to the South and if the Antarctic ice sheet is large, it can expand to the North. And then if we're looking at the tectonics, we're interested in the Drake Passage and also the uplift of the Southern Andes. And here's just a slide of the, on the right-hand side, the energy, how fast the red and oranges are fast circulation. And this is the Antarctic circumpolar current going through the Drake Passage. In this lower right picture, you can see the Southern Andes with the Patagonian ice sheet. And this is where Sam Bova and Yair took a group of us in July and August before our crews came right up through these fjords and you heard Sam's talk a few weeks ago. Now, the Argentine margin, here's the last little piece of information, is sculpted by strong currents. And these currents flow along topography and they erode right in here and throw the sediments over forming what we call contrarites or sediment drifts. So erosion and accumulation right in here. And um, it's highly, highly um, um, dynamic situation or region of the world here. And these currents have sculpted the Southern Argentine margin into four terraces. Uh, the Nahara Terrace, which steps down to Perito Moreno, Piedra Buena, and the Valentin Fieldberg. And interestingly, 
the four water masses that we see originating out of the Southern Ocean today are aligned with each of these terraces with Antarctic intermediate water sculpting this step right here and flowing across the Nahara. Upper circumpolar deep water eroding the step here and flowing across Paridge and Lorraine and lower circumpolar deep water and Antarctic bottom water sculpting and focusing sediments here. And once again, here's our study area right at here, the Southern Andes over in here, and we're going to zoom in right in here. You can see the Nahara, Perito Moreno, Piedra Buena, and the Valentin Fieldberg, and then the deep South Atlantic down in here. We're about to look at a seismic line that goes from the Perito Moreno out across the valley. Fieldberg. This is uh, Jens Grutzner's um, work right in here. And it became, you know, it's how we understand what is going on on the, uh, the geologically speaking, on the southern Argentine margin. Here's his seismic line from the Perito Moreno out into the deep. Here are the water masses out here on the right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you with red being basement. Um, ocean crust here and then continental crust over here. We're going to step through from starting with the green reflector, which is called, um, uh, which has been assigned an age of the KT boundary 66 million years ago. And so this is what it looked at at the time. And if we look in this area, there is some downslope transport and some evidence of a, a, a weak current according to Yins and other people. So there was probably a current flowing into the screen um, from south to north right in here. The next reflector up shows a remarkable shift in sedimentation. We see over a kilometer and a half thick of sediments right in here. And we probably had a current here and a current here plastering the sediments up against the Argentine margin. And also quite a bit of evidence for a deeper current out in here, which is probably proto Antarctic bottom water. The next one up, kind of a quiescent zone, this interval between AR6 and AR5 shows some evidence of current circulation out in here, but in general drapes the whole area. So the idea is that this was a much more quiet time. Um, at least with respect to deep ocean currents. And then we put this um, um, latest pile and we're taught of sediments with uh, probably a current here and a current in here and um, forms what we have termed the Valentine Fieldberg Terrace. So let me step you through climatically what we looked at. A KT boundary um, reflector. And in between the KT boundary reflector, there was some evidence for not strong for circulation, but not strong. And in this time, we had the Eocene climate optimum where there were alligators up on Svalbard and Axel Heiberg at 80 degrees north. Then a global cooling associated with the drawdown of CO2, possibly and probably the weathering of the Deccan traps during this time. And then we had the expansion of the East Antarctic ice sheet. This formed the uh, reflector AR4, and it's been correlated with the opening of the Drake Passage. Miocene climate optimum from 17 to 15 is marked by the base of AR5 and um, ends at the uh, AR6 reflector. This is when Antarctica grew to its present margin and became a permanent fixture of our for our planet. Somewhere in this time, we had the closure of the Panamanian Isthmus, and it is a progressive closure, so it wasn't an on-off event and may have been associated with a reflector AR4 and then larger hemisphere ice sheets. So I'm just going to take a, a few minutes here to show you two aspects. There's so much more to come out of this study, but I'm going to look at the coring along the Piedra Buena Terrace. And that is this 
keras that is shown by these pale yellows and light oranges. You can see the step down from Perito Moreno, a step down to Piedra Buena Terrace. And we have uh, 10 jumbo piston cores from 48 degrees south all the way up to uh, 45 and a half degrees south. So it's two and a half um, uh, degrees of latitude, almost um, uh, almost 300 kilometers over this interval. Um, and here are Ruby and Tanner in the MSCL lab, the multi-sensor core logger lab, and all of our cores were run through that. And what you see on the rock is one core, 43 JPC, is on the um, Piedra Buena uh, Terrace. And what you see is magnetic susceptibility and density over here. And, and one of the things we see is the spikes at high density going over two grams per cc. But we also have this low density, low magnetic susceptibility interval with a spike in the middle um, that is pervasive throughout the Piedra Buena uh, Terrace. And when we split the cores, this white interval is very, very chalky, which was very surprising uh, to find down at 48 degrees south. We see this white chalky interval, and it's not just one or two, uh, not a few tenths of centimeters, but it's upwards of four meters of core in some of these places. Whereas most of the time we got this dark gray mud right in here. And once again, as we go from south, 25 JPC all the way to the north end of our study area, we see this low susceptibility interval um, right in here with this peak, which is correlatable from uh, core to core to core. What you see though, is as you move to the north, this um, much higher sedimentation rates. And if you look at the canyons uh, and the surface topography over on this particular map, and in fact, I'll show you the north end, and here's the seismic. We have nice drifts, but this is from Jose Azola's work, and this is, I thank you, Jose. We won't publish this, but it illustrates how smooth it is up here is that the canyons bring the sediments down and the currents shape them into these beautiful uh, sedimentary drifts. But when we get down into this region right in here, it is heavily eroded, and there's virtually no modern sedimentation occurring in this region. So there is um, interesting and coherent patterns, and that white layer is extremely interesting. And um, Yair is going to ask me the question, uh, what do you think that white interval represents? And I have no idea but I think we'll both guess it might be the last interglacial, but that's a pure guess right now. Let's shift to the um, uh, seismic data uh, collection. And we are now going to be looking at seismic at the Valentin Fieldberg drift right in here. It will be the target or the main focus in our International Ocean Discovery um, uh, Program proposal that we'll submit on October 1st. And we're gonna target the last 15 million years. This is when Antarctica became a permanent fixture. And circulation began to look like what it, what it um, does today. Um, and if you look at Jens's work and Javier Hernandez Molina's work and Gabby's work and other people's work, there's a lot of interesting things going on in this interval. This is just to remind me that Aaron Waters processed all of our seismic lines for us um, once he got back to um, Rutgers and he and I spread out in our conference room here and had seismic lines everywhere. And we were looking at them right in here. But we are going to look and focus in on this particular area of the Valentin Fieldberg both the German uh, BGR 2004-06 line and our line 16, 
we're over the same track. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence and we can transfer their seismic reflections onto our seismic lines. And once again, here's where we're going to be looking at um, over the last 14 million years. This is a black and white representation. We had it in color, but for some reason, it didn't show what I wanna show as well. But here's the AR6, which has been interpreted to be the uh, onset of the modern Antarctic circumpolar current as we know it about 14 million years ago. And the first thing you see, and I like standing far away from my computer, but clearly, most of the accumulation in the low, uh, you know, in the older stuff occurred to the west. And then there was a shift to this area to the east, somewhere right around it here. And this is where Jens and Javier and other people have placed AR7. Uh, then they've subdivided it further uh, with VF1, VF2, VF3 is AR7, VF4. I, I put a green line in here, or actually Aaron did, because we, we want to focus in on this particular area right in here. So the next slide will be a blow up of this particular area, focusing in what is going on here. Oh, before I go, uh, you can see that there must have been a current piling up sediments here and eroding here and another current out in here piling sediments up this way and so something must have fundamentally changed at AR7. So here's that blow up and what I want you to focus in on are these acoustically transparent, I mean there are reflections but they're not organized in any way. And a couple of things could be, or three things might explain this. It could be downslope mass wasting, and that would produce a chaotic um, sedimentation uh, pattern and therefore reflection pattern. It could be that the seismic features that we see, the beautiful mud waves out in here, are too small to be imaged. So um, we just seismically can't image it. Or it could be that it is winnowed, removing all of the fine grain sediments and so that everything is coarse and therefore um, does not produce uh, reflections. And so those are these two, I call them acoustically transparent zones, but there's just no organized reflections within them. And then we will identify a VF3, which is the base of this um, zone right in here. And we're going to propose and work with Jens on I, calling this the base of the parent zone, uh, a new uh, reflector VF5, which you can trace out to here. So as we move forward a little bit, I, and I'm leaving out about 20 minutes of background material, but. If you looked at the seismic lines, you could see there was seismic, um, there were rhythmic seismic reflections in there. And if they're related to something in the Earth's system, um, they could be um, climatically driven or formed. And we have um, several periods that we can look at, a 20,000 year Period. Well, I'm going to rule that one out right now because that is too fast or too short of a period for our seismic uh, imagery to see. Could be uh, a 40,000 year where the Earth tilts more and tilts less, tilts more, and that happens every 40,000 years. If we had sedimentation rates like what Yair and Sam covered, we could see obliquity in our seismic lines. I'll focus in on eccentricity, and the short answer is, because I don't have a lot of time, is that we're, the cycles that we see are probably the 400,000 year cycle. At least that's my guess. So, um, forgot to blank that out. So here are the AR6 to VF5 that we identified, or Yins and others have identified. And what I'm going to do is transfer them over onto a different seismic line um, because it seemed to have more even um, uh, 
uh, uh, reflectors here. It crosses right here at this point, cheating. I'm not making this up. And then here's the other half. Oh, here's the seismic reflectors uh, on this particular line, line 37. And here's what it looks like with the full, full line. And you can see the nice rhythmic seismic reflections right in here. Here's AR7. I'm not going to draw them in here. And then AR7 prime and so forth and so on. I took just a grayscale image from this particular area and it shows it right in here. And you can see the uh, low grayscale values are the darks and we can see them lining up very simply right in here. And so we've um, reproduced what the um, seismic reflections look like and threw it into analysis series, quick and dirty, um, because at this particular point, a lot more work needs to go in to um, before we do a full scale frequency analysis, but we can see power in what is one over frequency is one over 30.5. And that's about every 30, whoops, every 0 0.033 seconds or every 25 meters is what we have. These reflections seem to be, I mean, they vary in thickness, but, um, there seems to be somewhat power about every 25 meters. And then what I did was I counted the number of cycles um, from the seafloor down to VF5, VF5 down to VF4, and so forth and so on, all the way down to VF2. And then I shifted over here to count the cycles further down. But just to get to it, there were Here's the number of cycles between the reflectors, and here's the cumulative reflectors. And if you uh, assume that these reflections are the long eccentricity 0 0.405 million years or 405,000 years, it would put the base of this sequence as 14.6 million years. VF1 would be about 13 million years, and so forth and so on. The 5.3 age for VF4 is interesting because that's the base of the Pliocene. And then the base of VF5 would be 2.4, which is pretty close to the age of the, uh, the base of the Pleistocene top of the Pliocene. So the major events, let's just summarize and I'm close to ending now. Around 14 million years, there was the onset of drift accumulation in the deep basin. This uh, corresponds to the expansion of the Antarctic ice sheet. Around 12.5 million years ago, marked by this interval from VF1 to VF2, was the major phase of drift accumulation down in there. So it started here, but it really ramped up around 12 and a half to 13 million years ago. At AR, at about eight and a half billion years, if you believe this, there was a shift in deposition from the western part of the um, um, basin to the east. And from 7.7 .7 to 5.3 million years ago, we had the development of this acoustically, acoustically transparent facies. And then at about two and a half million years ago, we had the, uh, the root shift of the facies up to the west to shallower depths. Our preliminary results, I just kind of gave them through there. We have sampling plans. Um, well, we had hoped to be going now. The cores arrived at Oregon State. Uh, in February, we learned March 10th that we couldn't travel. Oregon State, we just talked to um, or communicated with uh, yesterday, and they will sample two of our representative cores, allowing us to start dating and doing lithology and some geochemistry of them. And by October 1st, we hope to submit our full IODP proposal. With that, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>